Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with former NBA player Troy Hudson is brought to you by Compassion International. We're so thankful to have them on board as a partner, as a sponsor here with us at Sports Spectrum. And we've been telling you about Compassion for almost a year now. And listen, they're the most trusted child development ministry in the world. It's as simple as that. They're a Christian child development organization that works to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. It's founded in 1952. They partner with more than 7,000 churches in 25 countries to serve over 2 million babies, children, and young adults. And the great thing about Compassion is it's about one child at a time and it connects you directly with that child. And that's where you and I come in. One of the great things that my family does that we do is sponsor a child through Compassion. For $38 a month, we are directly connected to this teenage boy in Haiti and we get to release him from poverty. Food, education, medical care, and vocational training all done in Jesus' name. It's wonderful and I want to encourage you to get on board as well. Sponsor a child today through Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Pray about it. Choose the child that you want to sponsor and release them from poverty today. Today's guest on the podcast is Troy Hudson. Now, he is the Minnesota Timberwolves team chaplain. But if you're a child of the 90s and the early 2000s, you might remember Troy Hudson as an NBA player. He played for a decade in the NBA from 1998 to 2008. He played a little bit with Utah, then went to the Clippers. You might remember his time in Orlando with Tracy McGrady and during those years. And then he went to Minnesota, and that's where he really made his mark in the NBA as a point guard, playing with Kevin Garnett and making quite a few playoff appearances. So he was with Minnesota from 2002 to 2007 and then finished out his career in the NBA with Golden State in 2007 to 2008. And Troy joins us here because it's a unique situation here that we have with a guy who is now a team chaplain but played in the NBA. There aren't many team chaplains out there who played as a player for many years in the NBA. So he has a unique perspective, I think, on faith and the, the state of faith in the NBA. So that's what we talk about here with Troy Hudson. Lots of fun stuff here about the state of faith, about what his job, his role is as a chaplain. And then we get into a little bit about his NBA career as well. His first game ever as a member of the Utah Jazz in the NBA is a great story. And then his favorite moment. Uh, and they both entail playing against his childhood team that he rooted for as a kid, Magic Johnson and the Los Angeles Lakers. Good stuff here from Troy Hudson. Take a listen to his journey, his story, here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Troy, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to talk to you, Troy. And I know that you have a, the very unique distinction of being a former NBA player who's now in ministry and sharing the gospel as the chaplain for the T-Wolves. Let's start there. Take us through what your role as a team chaplain sort of entails for you on a day to day basis. Um, well, day to day, I mean, you always have to, you know, um, you know, be in the word of God and um, trying to figure out ways to, you know, deliver messages uh, to the athletes that are, you know, kind of unique in a way to where they can, you know, understand it, you know, with with athletes, especially professional athletes. Um, you know, they live, they live a different lifestyle. Um, they have a, a lot of things that come at them on a daily basis. And I know that, you know, from being a, a former professional athlete, um, they have a lot of stuff coming at them on a daily basis from, you know, uh, friendships, loved ones to even, you know, the strangers. And, you know, th there's a lot of, you know, emotions and, and things, um, from that standpoint and their professional life 
of handling certain situations. So, you know, I, I think each message that's, you know, delivered, you know, to the athlete has to, you know, is, is unique. It's still the, it's still the same word. Nothing changes um, in the word of God, yeah. but the way you deliver it to them, um, I think it has to be unique. And, you know, I think that's where I fit in because, you know, I, I sat in their seat, you know, I, I played in that league and I understand some of the things that could be happening or going on in their life on a daily basis. So I try to make sure that I'm sharp in understanding and, and, and making the word relevant to, you know, what they're going through or what they could be going through on a daily basis. What's it look like when you're sharing your message? It's usually, I think, the way NBA Chapel works before the home games and both teams kind of come together. So how is how is that for you, obviously, as the T-Wolves team chaplain, but also spending, I guess, the time to put together a message and then share it with both teams? Um, I mean, it's great. It's great, especially when you see some of the, you know, the, the, the um, stars, you know, that, that you watch and that people watch on TV and, you know, you, you may think, uh, something different of them, um, from, you know, what they do, um, on the basketball court. But then when they come into that, you know, that chapel service, all of them are just so humble and, uh, hungry, you know, for the word of God. And that, that says a lot, you know, about the league and about the guys that actually, you know, attend chapel. And I know there are some that don't come that, that still um, open their Bibles, you know, in their hotel room before they, you know, arrive to the arena. So, I mean, I think from that standpoint, you know, the NBA is in great hands. Um, but it's just so good, you know, when you see um, both teams in chapel because at that time it's, it's no competition right um in in 20 minutes they're going to go out on the floor and, and and try to destroy each other but you know when we're in chapel it's like you know which is just a brotherhood um while we're in there and everyone's just trying to become a better person and just you know it's it's just is a is a, a breath of fresh air just to see some of the you know the best talent and, and best athletes in the world just try to learn, you know, the word of God and get filled, um, you know, before they go out and, and compete, you know, for the world. And I mean, that's, that's the, that's the great thing about it. And, you know, it just, it lights you up to, you know, when you, when you finish delivering the message and all of them are just like, thank you. I needed that, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because in so many, so many ways in life, people think, you know, guys that make millions and millions of dollars don't need anything. In something just you know, it's it's it's, it's important as the word is. It's it's a small thing um, to be able to deliver to them, but it's 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 huge. It's a huge impact on them, and they always show their gratitude by saying, you know, thank you. We really appreciated that. Is that one of the hardest things you've seen in ministering as a chaplain? Is the pull of the world and the temptations and all the things that come with being in the NBA as a professional athlete, but also having you know that really a different type of lifestyle, like you said, with the money and all that. Is that something that guys have a tough balance with in terms of trying to still walk that walk of faith? Yes, and I believe so. I believe so. Um, you know, even with my personal uh, experiences um, of being in the NBA, like I always tell people, you know, I, I know who God was. I read my Bible. Um, you know, I, I, I did, you know, most of what I needed to do, you know, as a Christian, but I still stumbled. Um, and we'll, we'll stumble for the rest of our life. You know, that's why, you yeah. know, no one's perfect, but you know, it doesn't help when you're, you're given, you know, a lot of money, a lot of opportunity. You can almost do any, almost anything you want, especially financially. Um, so it's, it's, it's always a test. And, you know, that's, that's why it's good for those guys to, you know, attend chapel, attend church, uh, read, read their word because when you have so much, so much, opportunity and so much um so many finances that you can just do things at the of a drop of a dime um it makes it easier for temptation to to have a stronghold troy hudson's our guest here on the sports spectrum podcast let's talk about your testimony we always like to ask all of our guests what their testimony is like when they came to christ tell us about your journey through your faith walk and how jesus became lord of your life um, like I said earlier, you know, I, I've always, you know, believed in God. I always knew his power. 
always knew that, you know, the reasons why I was in certain situations um, in my life is because of Jesus. So I, I knew all of that stuff. I mean, even growing up, um, you know, my uncle was my mentor who was a minister. So I heard the word of God going to and from basketball games. And, you know, whenever a situation would arise in my life, he would always have a scripture or we'll pray over it. And, and, and I understood that. But I didn't know it for myself, right? You know, he'll 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 say a scripture, and I kind of knew scriptures um, off the top of my head just because he would say those scriptures. So I understood them, and I understood the power in them. But I didn't have that personal um, relationship uh, with God until probably like two thousand and eight. Okay. So even during my playing career, like I would pray, I pray before every single game. Um, I read the Bible before every single game, but just that unique individual relationship um, with with God, I didn't have that um, the way that I I wanted it. So that's when I, you know, I finally got baptized in two thousand and eight. Um, my mom said I was baptized as a kid, but of course I didn't remember that so long ago. Um, but you know, I, I, I say, you know what? Let me go ahead and do it and make sure I am baptized. So yeah. I went and got baptized in 2008. And from that point on, I just start seeking them and seeking them and seeking them. Um, but you know, like I said, even when I was in, in Orlando Magic, there's a Sports Illustrated article, um, that I recently, um, found. Yeah. And it, it it's amazing because it was talking about how I would put this oil on me after every basketball game, and some of the some of the players like Daryl Armstrong. One day they just like, yo, what what is this oil you putting on you? And I said, you know, it's anointing oil. And they start, you know, saying, you know what, I was playing really good that year. They said, you know what. Can you give me some bottles of that? Because the way you plan, we all need some. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, those little things like that, I think that's when, you know, God started putting that seed of, of ministry in me. You know, sometimes you can be ministering to people without even knowing it. And, you know, so that kind of took me back to 2001. Like, whoa, you know, even before I really got serious, he was already using me. When you, you say you got not saved, but I guess that developed that real deep personal relationship in 2008, did that have to do with, and coincidentally being your last year in the NBA in 2008? And, and did it have to do with the lifestyle maybe changing a little bit? And, you know, because I wonder, is the lifestyle of an NBA player conducive to really deeply having that personal relationship with God with everything that you're sort of obligated to do? Um, I, I believe it had some, some, um, you know, some influence uh, on that. You know, like you said, um, at that time, you know, I was, I was injured. Um, so, you know, m most of it was kind of reflecting on, you know, where am I, go where am I going to go from here? Yeah. I, I hadn't made up my mind at that time whether I was going to, you know, retire or try to, you know, make a comeback. Um, because, you know, it was just, you know, I was injured. So. Right. You know, um, I didn't play again after that, but I hadn't made up my mind at that time. But something just, you know, I just woke up one morning like, I need to go get baptized. So I don't know exactly what it was, um, but I, that probably could have had, you know, some sort of influence. Um, you know, of course, things were slowing down for me. Um, you know, I started to, uh, you know, not, you know, run the streets as much, um, you know, just sit around the house and, um just start reflecting on life more. And I believe, you know, that was just God saying, you know, it's, it's time. It's time for you, you know, to really, really get to know me in order for you to be able to tell other people about me. Your NBA journey, Troy, it wasn't exactly the get drafted in the first round and go on to, you know, 15 straight all-star games. It was a grind for you. And you were, you went through that and worked really hard to get through those early years going undrafted and even playing in the CBA before you came to the NBA. Take us, take us through what those early years of pro ball was like for you on the court, what that was like to just be grinding and trying to earn your, your keep in the NBA. Um, actually it was, it was, it was difficult. Um, and you know, even, you know, trying to make it to the NBA because that, that, that's your, your ultimate dream, right? Is to, to make it to the highest level yeah. of basketball. And the, the hardest part about it is knowing that you're talented enough to make it. 
Mm. And understanding that, you know, it's not always about talent. You know, if, if a team doesn't have a roster spot or maybe, you know, that GM or, or, or coach, um, doesn't like you, you know, as a player or you just don't fit, you know, their style of play. You know, that's the most frustrating part because my first few years, you know, I went from camp to camp to camp to workout to workout to workout. And I was going to those workouts knowing that I probably wasn't going to make the team because, you know, they don't have a roster spot or, you know, I'm going to camp with the Utah Jazz. And I'm like, okay, they have Howard Isley, uh, John Stockton, and their first round draft pick is, uh, Jock Vaughn. So that's three point guards yeah. already. So I kind of know, like, okay, I'm just going here to build a resume and, and, and show my talent to this team so that when another team calls, they can say, yes, he's a hard worker. And so I understood why I was doing certain things, but it was still hard because, you know, in the back of your mind, it's like, am I ever going to make it? Um, you know, and when I finally did, um, after coming out of the CBA, uh, which in, in, in my days, it's not like the G League. Like, you know, I went back and played in the G League in 2012. And I was like, whoa, we're actually staying in hotels, not motels. You know, <laughs> in the C CBA, we were in motels and we were buses. So it was a different grind in, in your uh, minor league than what it is now. But even when I came out of there, and I end up, you know, making a team and get, getting a two-year deal. Um, then I got a two-year deal in Orlando. And then I came to Minnesota and signed a two-year deal and then eventually signed a six-year deal. And I tell people all the time, even I, even though I had um, those deals, every year I still felt like I was playing not to get cut. Mm. So I don't even know if I ever really just relaxed and enjoyed the NBA um, the way that I could have. What do you remember about your first game? Maybe take us to that moment of getting called up and, and, and finding out, I believe it was Utah, finding out that you're going to play in the NBA and what that moment was like for you. Um, oh, that moment was great. Um, the thing with Utah is, you know, I got to camp. So I, I, I started off with them um, in camp and I just played my butt off, you know, and I played hard, you know, that, I mean, that was just the way I played. And for the first time in, I think, his career, John Stockton, you know, had to sit out the beginning of the season because he had to get a, a knee scope. Mm. And so um, I was able to make their opening day roster, and I ended up playing 25 games with them. But it's, it's it was surreal for me because I still remember the first game was Halloween night at the Great Western Forum. Mm. And growing up, I was like – in a crazy Lakers fan. Like, Magic Johnson is my favorite player of all time. So, you know, you have dreams of playing in a great, great Western form, right? So that was my first game. Um, we were we were getting blew out, so I was able to get in the game, and I went two for two. So my first career points was against the Lakers, and, you know, my best games ever has always been against the Lakers. So I tell people it's just something about that purple and gold when I see it in front of me. Um, my, my, you know, my eyes just light up. Yeah, and a few years later, you faced them in the playoffs with Minnesota, too. That must have been a thrill. And really being a contributor to a good team with those Timberwolves teams and playing the Lakers. And they were in their heyday during those times with Shaq and Kobe, right? Yes, they were coming off, of, I believe, that a uh, three-peat. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we took them to... I think six games. We uh, we took them to six games, and um, I mean, we had a chance. We just, you know, they were Shaq and Kobe, so we just we ran out of juice. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite NBA moment? If I was to ask you to look back, you played, you know, a good decade or so in the NBA. What's your favorite moment that stands out to you? I would say that moment um, in the playoffs in two thousand and three. Um, you know, against the Lakers. I mean, because like you know, you I averaged like twenty five that series, and it's the playoffs. You're, you're, you're in L.A. and you see, you know, you got Jack Nicholson, um, you got Denzel Washington, you got all the who's who's on, you know, the sideline and you're able to perform against one of the, um, you know, story franchises in, in league history and you perform at that level. Um, to me, that was a, a real, you know, it's a real moment. And then uh, one time during the game, I was checking in and Jack Nicholson said, Hudson, 
don't you start that tonight. <laughs> and I'm like, Jack Nicholson know my name. That's so, you cool. know, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, you know, those are some real moments, especially coming from, a, you know, a small town like Carbondale, Illinois. Like no one would ever, you know, suspect that that would happen to him. Troy Hudson's here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. A couple more questions here, Troy. I wonder for you, because you played, it's 20 years now or so since you made your debut. What's the state of faith in the NBA, maybe now and then how it compares to what it was when you came into the league in 98? I know your walk is obviously different, but just the state of faith in the NBA and maybe the perception of it versus the reality then to now. Um, I think it's it's – it's probably the same, right? Um, okay. you, you had a lot of guys back when I came in the league that you knew. Um, Monty Williams, um, David Robinson, Avery Johnson, Irvin Johnson, not Magic, but Irvin Johnson from, uh, from, yeah. uh, from New Orleans. Uh, you had him. And a lot of those guys were, you know, older guys um, that's from the, you know, 60s they're born in the 60s so they come they came from households where you know they probably had to go to church more often than kids in in households today but like you didn't know that about them unless you were kind of like in the nba right um but now you have more guys that are actually letting you know about their faith um mm-hmm. you know anthony tolliver uh steph curry um a lot of guys that um, just, you know, let you know, like they wear it on their sleeve. Yeah. And I think social media has a lot to do with that. Um, but as far as the state of it, I, I mean, I love it because you now you see those influential people like Steph Curry, the way he influences these kids, um, their game, but they also know that he, he loves and believes in Christ. And so that that's one thing that I love about him is that, he he shows that, and and now kids can start gravitating to what he gravitates to, right? Um, so it, it becomes more than just uh, the game of basketball and his game. Uh, it becomes like, okay, what does Steph Curry do? Oh, he reads his Bible. Oh, he loves Christ. Okay, he he passes chest and points to the sky on his three pointer. Now you've seen all these kids do that. So I believe that is really influencing the way um, Christ is being portrayed in in all of the athletes' life. Um, like Tim Tebow, you know, he changed a whole culture yeah. um, because of his faith. And so now I think sports is in, in, in great hands. And, and, and the reason being is because they're really uh, the athletes in today's era are letting you know who they are and how much they believe in Christ. Is that something you encourage with the players that you mentor and talk to? And I know you're you're even involved in youth sports now. And obviously there's a line of, of living out your faith, but not forcing your faith on people. Is that something that you've encouraged the people though, that you, uh, influence in your lives, maybe even as a chaplain or as a coach to, to be open about their faith, obviously never forcing it, but to be open about their faith. Oh, definitely. Um, especially, especially at, at the chaplain level, um, with professional sports, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for us to say, you know, um, and talk about God because that's, that's what they're there for. You yeah. know, they want to hear about God. And so, yeah, of course, you know, we, we always try to, you know, let them know that, you know, it's important that you understand that no matter what you think, um, I tell, I tell people this all the time, no matter what you think, you are a minister and you have a ministry. Now, is your ministry either going to be good or it's going to be bad? You know, you don't have to be in the pulpit. You don't have to be Joel Osteen on TV. Every every human being has a ministry, right? So yeah. it all it's all dependent on what you're going to show the world and show them how to live, right? It's either going to be good or bad. So um, I always let them know that, you know, you don't have to, you know, be the greatest, you know, Bible scholar, Bible scholar right. um, to know, you know, you are influencing somebody. And so I, you know, encourage them to, you know, just live, live the right way. Um, you don't have to just run up to people and say, Jesus, 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 you know, you can just go up to people and say, you know, I love you. You know, that is, you know, Jesus, right? Yeah. Um, so even with even with my my younger um, kids, uh, my high school kids, and in my youth teams, um, you know, uh, it, it's a it's a different. You have to kind of you know tame it down a little. But through all my messaging, through the way I teach the game, I'm teaching in in a spirit of love, in a spirit of understanding, 
and 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 wisdom in the in, in the whole. So without just you know forcing the religion or or Christ on them, they're getting it. Troy, a couple more questions here. What's what do you think is your biggest concern in this NBA culture? That's that we live in right now. The NBA is global. It's maybe becoming the most popular sport on, you know, rivaling the NFL, I would say. What is your concern though in being in seeing the NBA culture? There's obviously a lot of great things happening, but as a, a minister, as a chaplain, you see a lot of things that I don't see or others don't see when the curtain behind the behind the curtain, if you will. What's some of your concerns that you might have that you're you're praying about that's kind of, you know, touching your spirit a little bit? Um, I would say outside influence um, on the athletes. Um, the athletes are, you know, they're very wise. They're very understanding and knowledgeable. Um, but a lot of them are young. Um, and a lot of them are um, influenced by others. Like, you would be amazed, because I, I was the same way. Yeah. You would be amazed on how many, you know, athletes want to be um, the big time rapper, right? I was the same way. And, and so you're influenced by, um, like the hip hop culture, right? Um, you, you hear some of these songs and you know, some of the artists and what they portray. And a lot of them are not, a lot of the artists are not even like that, but they understand what sells, right? They understand saying sex, drugs and rock and roll and hip hop. They understand that sells. So they, they go into character as well. But my only, you know, one of my biggest concerns is when I see, you know, the athletes try to jump into those kind of uh, realms um, and not understanding how powerful that influence is, you know, like it, it's not it's not something that you can play with. And, you know, um, and, and a lot of times I, I feel like they don't understand, it, you know, they're singing certain songs, you know, on social media. Now the kids that are looking up to them thinks, okay, it's okay to sing about Molly and Percocet. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So that piece right there is what, you know, to me, that piece is, is, is probably the most disturbing is for them to understand that, you know, you don't have to go that route to still be cool and, and understand that you have little kids looking up to you. So you can't say that's okay, you know, what those rappers are doing and what they're talking about, right? Because if you do that, then now the kids are going to get the wrong idea. Yeah, that's really good. Troy, it's been great talking to you here on the podcast. The last question that we always ask to all of our guests is an easy question, sometimes not an easy answer. But what is God teaching you right now in the season of life that you're in? In your early 40s now, you're, you're a chaplain, you're coaching, and you're training athletes, young, young athletes, you're in youth sports. What has God been teaching you during this season of life? Um, I think just patience. You know, um, patience. I have, you know, I, I also have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-year-old. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and I predominantly coach girls. So I think he's really, I think he's really just teaching me patience, um, and, 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 and how to understand, you know, everyone that I come in contact with, um, and to be just a, a teacher of his word and of his spirit, um, to people. And I think, um, basically just patience. I think he's really working because once you have patience, everything else slows down. Mm. And you're able to make wiser and more uh, knowledgeable decisions. And you're able to give that wisdom to people once you kind of slow down a little. Right. So I think that that's exactly what he's working on with me is just, you know, continue patience and just waiting on him um, and getting straight directive from him. He is Troy Hudson, the Minnesota Timberwolves team chaplain, longtime NBA player. Troy, it's been great uh, talking to you on the podcast. Thanks for sharing a little bit of your heart and your journey, and uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Many thanks to Troy Hudson, the Minnesota Timberwolves team chaplain, longtime NBA player for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. I really love the story he told about playing his first ever NBA game as a member of the Utah Jazz against the Lakers in 1998 really fun story there about just returning to his childhood team that he rooted for and getting to 
get his first taste of NBA action. So fun stuff there from Troy Hudson. Thanks for joining us here, Troy. We really appreciate you being a part of the podcast. We also appreciate Compassion International for sponsoring this podcast. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. And listen, they've been a part of this ministry here at Sports Spectrum now for about a year, partnering with us, and we couldn't be happier to have them on board with all that we're doing here at Sports Spectrum and all that they're doing with Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Think about sponsoring a child. I mean, it's really an awesome opportunity for you to release a kid from poverty with food, education, medical care, vocational training, $38 a month. That's all it is. It'll be the best $38 you spend every single month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast with Troy Hudson. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sports underscore Spectrum. Take a screenshot of this interview. Uh, Make sure you're sharing the link. Let's get the word out on the interviews that we've been doing on the intersection of sports and faith. I know that so many have been listening and and been encouraged. And honestly, our goal here with Sports Spectrum is to tell the stories of sports and faith. And like Jay Harris says in the beginning of the interview when he introduces the podcast, to bring Jesus back into the conversation and ultimately point people back to him. And we're grateful for that. You can also email me, jason at sportspectrum.com. Any guest ideas you might have or any feedback, thoughts that you might have on this interview with Troy Hudson. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time with a brand new episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.